Excellent. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to CSIS. Thank you all for joining us um, and uh, for braving the DC paranoia about snow, uh, or snow that's not really snow, but that causes snow days. Um, anyway, uh, I'm very thrilled to have Adriana Lopez here with us today. Adriana is the sister of Leopoldo Lopez, who is an opposition leader uh, who has been imprisoned in Venezuela uh, since this time last year. Uh, you may have heard of his interview last week with CNN in Spanish. Uh, if not, I suggest you check it out uh, on YouTube. Uh, I met uh, Adriana through my friend Tom Caraco, uh, who has known Leopoldo since they were both students at Kenyon College, and we're sort of doing this with Kenyon, so we're really appreciative of Kenyon's um, choosing us uh, to do this as well. Uh, but before I turn it to Adriana, I just want to provide a little context for today's uh, event. At this point, Venezuela is mired in social, economic, and political crisis. The crisis has been building for some time, but particularly since last year when protests spread across the country, reflecting popular dissatisfaction with the declining economy and Venezuela's increasingly repressive government. Dozens died during last year's protest, and earlier this week, we saw the first casualty of this year's protests, a 14-year-old student, a 14-year-old boy, shot by the police in an anti-government demonstration. Uh, last week, Venezuelan intelligence agents arrested Caracas mayor and opposition leader Antonio Ledesma, alleging that he was plotting with the United States to overthrow uh, Maduro's government. Uh, in this context, the protests have resurged, uh, with inflation over 60%, scarcity at 80%, Maduro's approval rating is under one quarter. Uh, and Venezuelans are, are unhappy, and they're demanding change. Uh, the environment in the country is nothing but uh, uh, nothing short of toxic, and it is with all of this in mind that I'm happy that we have Adriana with us today uh, to give us a sense of the situation uh, her brother faces in prison. She'll probably provide her insights uh, into the political dissatisfaction that's so widespread in Venezuela at the moment. Also. Joining us is Jared Gensler, the international lawyer representing Leopoldo Lopez, uh, who will participate in today's discussion as well, and I thank you for being with us uh, today. Uh, before we start, I want to remind you all that we're on the record this afternoon and that we're webcasting this event live to our online audience. Uh, other media outlets uh, have joined us as well. Uh, after uh, Adriana uh, speaks, and I think we'll get Jared involved as well. We'll have a Q&A. Uh, and this is a, a topic that's near and dear to a lot of folks here. So when you do have an opportunity to ask a question, um, you know, try to be as brief as you can so we can get as many uh, as we can. Uh, so um, uh, with that in mind, um, I'm going to pass it over to you, Adriana, and, uh, and we'll start from there. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Carl. Sure. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm Leopoldo's younger, uh, youngest sister, um, my six years, but we are actually very close. We're very similar in, in, in different ways, and, and, I, uh, and I think of Leopoldo as a mentor, and I, I really admire him. One thing I, I, I tell people uh, right off the bat is that everything that Leopoldo has done and did particularly last year and, and how events unfolded is absolutely coherent mm -hmm. with the way that Leopoldo is. Leopoldo is a man of very um, deep convictions, and he's a man that is very clear in his positions. He does not define himself in the gray areas. And actions like what he did um, last uh, February 18th demonstrate that he, he fights for what he believes and he doesn't waver. And I think that if anything has happened this year, it's just reaffirm to us as a family and to himself that that's the person that, that he is, and that's the right person to be. Mm. Um, I saw him recently, uh, three weeks ago, uh, actually three days before he had his last um, at requisa, when they came into his cell and, and took him away and put him in solitary confinement. And uh, I had not seen him since he had been in jail. And the first thing he said, he said, Adri, I'm doing well. I've been preparing myself for this mm. for a long time. And what he meant by that is that he has been persecuted by the Chavez government earlier and now by Maduro's. Uh, so he's had the chance to, to think that this was a possibility. And he has internalized what that meant. And with that, he has used the time to really focus 
on spiritual growth, intellectual growth, and working on, on what he sees uh, as his political, economic, social plan for, for the future. Yeah. He's a, a public servant. That's the one thing that defines him. Uh, a lot of people have asked why didn't he leave the country, uh, go in exile, uh, or remain in hiding. I don't think, um, I, I think of that scenario and I, and I see a very saddened individual, somebody that would be trapped by uh, the wrong decision. Uh, so when I saw Leopoldo, I saw the person that I know. His eyes were bright, uh, his smile was, was big, the, his big charismatic uh, smile that people recognize him by. And he was just, he knew that he was doing the right thing. He said it was, it's been very hard. The hardest thing has been to be separate uh, from his children. He has little children, five and two. Um, they were four and one when he w went to jail. So that's like any human being, that's just that, you know, the human piece is, is hard. You know, I had a child, he wasn't there for that birth. My sister got married, he was not there. My father turned 70 years old, he wasn't there. So he's missing, you know, we, we miss him. Uh, but we, we support him, we are with him and, and he's alive. We are all as a family working on his behalf. Uh, everybody has been doing different things, uh, but we have really taken it at heart to make sure that people know who Leopoldo is, because by knowing who Leopoldo is, you know about Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And another important thing about Leopoldo's action is that Leopoldo is a symbolic prisoner. Leopoldo was speaking on behalf of millions of people in Venezuela that don't have a voice. Leopoldo has the privilege of having a platform uh, that people listen to. And uh, by caring about Leopoldo, you care about other political prisoners. And, and that's really one of the missions that we have as a family is to ensure that that voice is heard. Can you, can you, you know, you, you, you've talked a lot about sort of the, the personal dimension, right? It, it, it's your brother, right? I mean, uh, people talk about the political side and obviously there's a huge context here and what people are, are suffering and, and people are, are, are fighting in, in Venezuela are very, you know, sensitive, passionate things. Can you talk a little bit about your brother's condition? How, how, how have they treated him? Um, you talked about his psychological condition a little bit. How is his health in general? Uh, I saw Leopoldo well. Uh, he's very thin, but he's very strong. Mm -hmm. um, now, he, fortunately, he has not been tortured like other people in Venezuela have. Uh, that we don't know uh, who or how or what has happened. We know that people are being tortured. Leopoldo has been tortured in a different way. He is getting a lot of psychological torture, so to speak, um, when they punish him without reasons. The, you know, his children show up to see him and they say, you can't come in, he's punished. Why? Well, he's just punished. So, you know, two weeks go by and he can't see his family. Uh, the first six months uh, of his imprisonment, he was not able to leave his cell. Um, he, they took him out in the mornings at six in the morning for mm -hmm. one hour, and that's all the daylight he got. And he had no interactions with any of the inmates or uh, any other people other than his uh, direct family. They have done things, I, you might have read about this, where they punished him by throwing excrement and urine uh, into his cell and cutting the water and electricity so that he couldn't, couldn't clean up. So those are the type of tortures that they do to him. When I went to visit him, uh, I was not allowed to see him three times. He was just in the last mm -hmm. bit that I was able to see him. Just little things that they do uh, because they knew that he really wanted to see him, mm -hmm. see me. So mm -hmm. that was upsetting. Mm -hmm. um, but they have really punished him a lot. Right now he's in solitary confinement again in a two by two cell. Uh, and it is detrimental to his health because he cannot see uh, the daylight for, for, for days mm -hmm. in a row. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, a lot of folks in, um, that cover Venezuela are very familiar with the story, um, but there's a lot of people that don't know very much about him, um, don't know why he's in jail. Um, and uh, there's a lot of folks who also wonder, what does the government fear about Leopoldo? I mean, why is he such a threat? Well, I'll answer the last question first. Uh, I think the government fears a person that has no fear. Leopoldo is absolutely fearless. And if anybody doubts that, then they haven't been paying attention. Mm. And, and I think it comes back to what I said. He has a very deep conviction of what is right. And by having such clarity, he is not afraid 
um, to confront the government and call out what's wrong. So why is he in prison? Is because he was, in his discourse and in his actions, uh, calling the government out uh, on the things that are bad with the system, uh, from an economic and a social standpoint, and the details are, are known to everybody. Uh, he was supporting uh, student protests on uh, February 12th, and he was um, calling for nonviolent, peaceful protests. And when it was over, he told people to peacefully leave the, the stage, so to speak. And um, then, you know, they set him up, and they're they're trying him for for inciting violence through his discourse. That's what supposedly he's being tried for. Mm -hmm. And um, things have gotten pretty rough in Venezuela, and things are pretty violent. Um, do you think that, that Leopoldo faces bigger risks when he's out of jail? I mean, how well, do you so see it's that? interesting to, to uh, if, we, if we go back to the week uh, mm -hmm. when Leopoldo was in hiding, uh, Leopoldo, this is a, an interesting uh, detail. So the, the protest that I was talking about on uh, February 12th, uh, he uh, leaves the, the, the place of the protest at around two in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. The deaths happen between two and three in the afternoon. And at 9 p.m., uh, the government had issued uh, a warrant for his arrest, mm -hmm. blaming him for this death. So there was definitely not enough time to pull all the evidence that would point to Leopoldo as the um, actor, mm -hmm. intellectual or material of this event. Mm -hmm. So this was obviously a frame. Um, so he goes into hiding after a press conference. And in those days, uh, there was a lot of talk, what to do, mm -hmm. uh, what the options were. In one of those nights, the government visited my family. Yeah. Uh, it was very late at night. My sister-in-law and the children were staying with my parents. They knock on the door. Uh, my father says, who is it? And uh, a voice says, we're looking for Leopoldo Lopez. And my father says, well, I'm here. <laughs> and he opens the door and sees men in masks with long arms, immediately closes the door. Mm -hmm. And they say, no, we are looking for Leopoldo Lopez. And he says, no, I'm here. No, we're looking for the other Leopoldo Lopez. And my father says, okay, well, wait. And you know, he, gets, he makes sure that the other, mind you, this is a man who's about to be 70, year old, 70 years old. My mother is 68. My sister-in-law and two children. That's it. There's nobody else at home. Mm -hmm. So he, sell, you know, he says, just you know, go, go, go in, in, in the living room. And he lets um, the people in. They did not have uh, a warrant mm -hmm. for search, mm -hmm. um, a search warrant. Uh, my father asked them to please take the masks off because it was extremely scary. And um, there, there was a moment when uh, the president of the National Assembly met with my family, and one of the things that he was trying to tell my parents was that, they, they, that he, the government, feared that Leopoldo was going to be assassinated, mm -hmm. that there was a plot for his murder, and that they wanted to protect Leopoldo, and that for that reason, they really encouraged him to leave the country or do not come out publicly. Now, who was plotting that? Uh, what, you know, what evidence they had for mm -hmm. that is, is, is unknown. Mm -hmm. And I'm just telling you this story as an inkling to tell you that anything can happen to Leopoldo when he steps mm -hmm. out. Anybody can be plotting uh, uh, an assassination. Now, again, Leopoldo is fearless. And I know that the day that Leopoldo comes out, he's going to go from one end to the, of the country to the other, and he's going to walk. And millions of people are going to go behind him, and that's going to be his protection. Mm -hmm. I want to bring you in the conversation a little bit. Um, what, what are your reactions to this? And you've seen lots of similar situations to these. You've worked on a lot of cases that are similar to this. Um, what do you think about all this? So, uh, so I'm an international human rights lawyer. My specialty is freeing prisoners of conscience around the world. Um, and Leopoldo Lopez is a classic prisoner of conscience. Um, you know, and uh, his case has become world renowned because of how outrageous it is what the government is doing to him. Uh, he's been charged with four crimes um, based on what happened on the events of the February, February 12th, even though he wasn't actually physically present when security officials uh, opened fire on a crowd and killed three people. Um, he's been charged with incitement to commit violence, conspiracy to commit violence, uh, arson and property damage. And um, literally, actually, in the last 24 hours, I have some breaking news to announce. Um, which is that the government's case has officially now fallen apart. The claim in the indictment, amazingly, was that even though they recognize that he's advocated nonviolence, even though he's called for change within the framework of the Constitution, even though he wants everything to be peaceful, the claim was that, uh, and even though he wasn't physically present at the events when the people were killed, uh, and the security, it was 
you know, security officials of the government that opened fire, not uh, protesters opening fire, uh, that he used subliminal messages to incite people to violence. This was the claim in the indictment. And they had a, a section of the indictment that goes on for several pages explaining how Leopoldo has a style of rhetoric that makes people very angry at the government and that they don't realize it, but it makes them so angry that they decide to go commit violence. Literally uh, yesterday, the trial has been ongoing at a pretty slow pace. There was a 12-hour sitting of the trial that went till about 2 in the morning, actually this morning. And the primary witness for that 12 hours was this, court, uh, this, this expert, who is a university professor, um, expert in linguistics, and uh, was the witness that was in the indictment. And uh, although she defended her case on the front end when being questioned by prosecutors under cross-examination, she actually acknowledged to the court that uh, Leopoldo was not responsible for the violence that took place uh, with the security uh, officials opening mm -hmm. fire, uh, that the grievances that he's expressing are legitimate grievances that reasonable people might have with the government. She wasn't taking a position as to whether they were right or wrong, but she said these are grievances that a lot of Venezuelans feel. And although we already knew that he didn't have superhero powers to inspire people to uh, uh, subliminal acts, uh, that, uh, that there was no evidence that he had, was capable of inspiring people to violence through subliminal messages. Mm -hmm. So the government doesn't need any evidence, obviously, to convict him of any crime. Um, the due process in this case has been equally outrageous and egregious. The, uh, I'll just give you a couple quick examples, and, mm -hmm. and then we can have more of a discussion. But a couple of quick examples. Um, you, you have, uh, in his case, 100 witnesses approved for the prosecution. The defense proposed 60 witnesses and a whole bunch of videos. The videos included him speaking to a crowd of hundreds of thousands and nobody committing any acts of violence, people you know, screaming, cheering, but doing everything nonviolently. Uh, they denied 58 of the 60 witnesses and all of the videos with no explanation. So 100 witnesses on one side, two on the other side. Um, the judge in the case is neither independent nor impartial. That's obviously well known with Venezuela. It isn't often as a human rights lawyer that I actually get the, you know, uh, can actually prove that the judiciary is not independent and impartial. In this case, we actually have proof of, the, of this fact. There was an initial judge assigned to the case who confirmed the terms of the indictment. And she had a friend in Miami who texted her afterwards, because I guess the friend believed her to be more pro-democratic, and said, how could you do that in a text message to the friend, uh, to, the, to the judge? And the judge responded, I had no choice or I would lose my job. Mm -hmm. uh, and that probably now former friend went to the media with that text message. Mm -hmm. The media proved that it was the judge's phone. And shockingly, the judge is now no longer on the case. And in fact, she's now in exile. Um, and then I would just say lastly that um, obviously a flagrant violation of the presumption of innocence over and over and over again. President Maduro attacking uh, Leopoldo, calling him the murderer of Ramo Verde prison. Uh, he hasn't been charged with murder, let alone convicted of it. So how is he the murderer of Ramo Verde? Uh, Maduro saying publicly that he's guilty and he will pay for his sins. All of these are, of course, a clear violation of the presumption of innocence. But this is a classic prisoner of conscience case. The charges are, are outrageous. The lack of due process is outrageous. And what's happening to Leopoldo, if it can happen to such a high profile person, imagine what it's like for the average person on the street who, you know, uh, a policeman gets angry for whatever reason and decides to do something to them. I mean, they have no hope or a prayer if they can do this to someone like Leopoldo. So, so who does this compare to? I mean, you've worked with a lot of situations like this. Does anyone in particular come to mind? Look, I mean, you know, I spent five years representing Aung San Suu Kyi of Burma while she was under house arrest. Um, he and she are very similar in a whole host of ways. Mm -hmm. um, I currently represent also Liu Xiaobo of China, the 2010 Nobel Peace Laureate. I began representing him six months before he won the prize. He was in prison for his writings, um, calling for change in China and calling actually for a transformation of the one-party system into a multi-party democracy. Um, Liu Xiaobo remains in prison. Um, and I mention those names because, frankly, there is very little difference, actually, between Leopoldo and the two of them. The other two may be slightly better known. I think Leopoldo is well on the way to becoming as well known as the two of them. And, uh, and it's because of what he stands for. And I think if you read his speeches and you, and you see how extraordinarily impressive he is, you see how fearless he is and the courage with which he's faced down the Maduro government, there are so few people in the world today that are inspirational figures. I mean, we are looking around for inspiring politicians in the United States. I know I'm looking a lot for people like that. Um, you don't see a lot. Um, but someone like him who stands for freedom, democracy, and human rights, his motto is all rights for all people. Um, and he, he's talked about how you know, he won't be the first political prisoner released. In fact, he will refuse to go unless all of them are released at the same time. 
Um, and despite what he's faced down with his own two children, his daughter, I mean, it's just such a terrible story, heartbreaking story. His daughter Man Manuela asked him in prison in front of uh, Leopoldo, asked Leopoldo in front of Lily and his wife, you know, Daddy, are you, are you gonna die here in prison? Um, and I think that that kind of gives you a sense of what he is going through personally and how heart-wrenching it must be for what he's going through. But people in this circumstance, in my experience, always come out of prison 100 times stronger and 100 times more powerful. And the irony is that just merely by sitting in prison as he is and having the world come and rally uh, support on his behalf and standing up to Maduro the way he is, he is inspiring tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people around the world. And he is a lot more powerful today than when Maduro first locked him up one year ago. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, on the news that you shared with us? What would be the next steps if this witness has sort of reversed their, their testimony? What would be the next steps from a legal uh, perspective? If only the law mattered in Venezuela. Um, I, can, I can give you my, uh, my political assessment, okay. which is going to be more valuable than my legal assessment. Obviously, I work closely with our Venezuelan lawyers. but. Um, uh, the law doesn't matter in Venezuela. So far, they've been dragging out this trial rather slowly. So mm -hmm. a little bit of history will be helpful. Uh, in 2008, uh, Leopoldo was, uh, had served his two four-year terms as ma the mayor of Chacao, the mm -hmm. municipality in Caracas, the central business district. And he was going to run for mayor of Grand Caracas. And he was up by 20, 30 points in the polls. He was viewed as being up by five or 10 points against Chavez in a hypothetical presidential matchup. So the government manufactured some bogus charges against him um, and ultimately he was disqualified from running for political office for six, for six mm -hmm. years. Um, the Inter-American Court later said that that was in violation of the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights. The government ignored it. So in any event, um, the government didn't think they had to worry about Leopoldo all that much until this past February. And then these public protests come about. And then um, you know, he's detained. His deprivation of political rights expired this past December. And in fact, unless he's convicted, uh, he can run for parliament uh, next fall, uh, even from his prison cell. And unfortunately, I think that the government needs to convict him to make him disqualified in order to be able to stand for the parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not clear yet what they're going to do. They've been slow rolling the trial at this point. I mean, with 100 witnesses on one side, and they were meeting about once a week for six or eight hours at a time. You can imagine how long mm -hmm. it might take. Um, and so far, they don't appear to be in any rush to get to a final outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and, but on the other hand, you know, judges in Venezuela have absolute discretion. And tomorrow, the judge could say, I've heard enough. We don't need any more witnesses. We're mm -hmm. done. I'm going to issue a judgment. So the short answer is I have no idea uh, what's going to happen. Clearly, this is damaging to the government. But the government, obviously, so far, doesn't care all that much about uh, how they're being viewed. Mm -hmm. If they charge him with crimes of using subliminal messages to incite people to violence, I don't know who they think believes that. Um, I can't even imagine that Maduro himself believes that that's actually possible. Um, but in any event, um, you know, we're going to have to see how that plays out uh, ultimately. I think what we're seeing swirling around in the background, as you alluded to in your, your very strong opening, is a rapid downward spiral mm -hmm. of the economic and political system in Venezuela. And Maduro being under immense pressure, um, you know, Venezuela is $45 billion to China. He recently went on a tour around the world to China to, uh, to other uh, lenders to try mm -hmm. to drum up more money and support. The price of oil has dropped you know, two thirds um, in the last year alone, which has been devastating for, uh, despite having the largest oil reserves in the world, uh, it's been devastating for the Venezuelan economy. Um, and you see stories every day about how extraordinarily the boulevard has been devalued. So the question for Maduro is how long can he hold on under, under these circumstances? And, uh, you know, I will say that as a human rights lawyer who's, who's gone up against many authoritarian governments, um, that, uh, you know, Maduro has been quite helpful to our cause by the way that he's reacted in a whole host of ways uh, to Leopoldo's imprisonment mm -hmm. and to repressing human rights in Venezuela. Um, and uh, we'll continue to rely on his assistance to help get Leopoldo out of prison because uh, he's not doing himself any favors here. Um, and the question is, will he be prepared to walk back from this or is he going to go down with the ship? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if, if I were somebody advising Maduro, I tell him that the dumbest thing that you did is lock Leopoldo Lopez up. <laughs> and the smartest thing that you can do is let him and all the other political prisoners out of jail. And yes, of course, Leopoldo will march and travel the country. But at the, but the, at the end of the day, um, Maduro has some very large problems other than Leopoldo Lopez. Uh, and he's not addressing them. And I think that that's ultimately why Leopoldo is so much more powerful today than he has been in the mm -hmm. past. Because the fundamental problems of insecurity, one person gunned down every 20 minutes, 25,000 people last year, you know, all the economic statistics you were talking about, 
the people of Venezuela are deeply unhappy, and it's not that Leopoldo Lopez is going to make them happy. Um, it's that Leopoldo wants to directly address the fundamental challenges facing the country, and Maduro does not. And by definition, that's going to make Leopoldo very, very popular. Okay. Yep. And it's only yep. become, he's only become more popular since he was detained. So the last time you spoke with your brother was when? Uh, three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. And the conditions he's in right now, um, describe him a little bit. And how long will he be in these conditions? Because what we know is that basically he's being punished right now for having given the interview that he did and the interview that's the CNN interview that I alluded to in the opening. Uh, you know, he's in worse conditions that, than the ones that he was uh, in the outset. How long is he going to be in those? My conditions? understanding is that he's not going back to his original cell. My okay. understanding is that that cell was, um, they went in and they spent seven hours destroying all of his personal belongings, which personal belongings in a, in a prison cell amount to books, writings, photographs and drawings or paintings. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is, it's very sad. Apparently the, the, the Cornell himself was ripping apart photos of his family in front of Leopoldo. Just the, 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 those type of episodes. Uh, I think uh, my understanding, nobody from my family has seen Leopoldo in this new cell, okay. only his lawyer, Juan Carlos um, Gutierrez. And it's a small cell and uh, Daniel Ceballos was also taken away from his cell mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. put in a smaller cell as well. I believe that the punishment, uh, solitary confinement punishment is gonna be lifted this weekend. Okay. Um, they have returned some of his books uh, to him, mm -hmm. but uh, I think that he's permanently moved to this okay. uh, smaller cell. Okay, well, I wanna sort of take an opportunity and, and get questions from folks in the audience. So this is the time if you'd like to ask a question. Why don't we start up here in the front? Mike, and then we'll move back. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Philip French. I'm a retired State Department. Uh, I'm also executive director of the American Committees on Foreign Relations. Thank you for being with us. Um, all sorts of questions pop up. You know, when Carl mentions all these statistics, one has to wonder. You know, I don't wonder. You know, that his uh, that Maduro's numbers are down to 25 percent. I wonder how are they as high as 25 percent given the situation. And so my question is. You know, there's supposedly a rift between the Capriles Radonsi camp and the Lopez uh, Corina Machado camp. And is that part of the reason why, despite things being so bad, there doesn't seem to be a groundswell of support for the opposition? Uh, and there seems to be a, a certain sense of resignation to what's happening in Venezuela. Thank you. Politics is a very complicated field, and it's not my field of expertise, it's my brother's. Um, it's, it's, the opposition in Venezuela has gone through some very dramatic changes over the last year, as it is obvious uh, with everything that has happened. Uh, I do believe that there are people that are more convinced, and actually the statistics say, uh, it's the highest number, it's 80% of the people believe that things need to change. Now, whether they are going for one candidate or another, or one political party or another, it's, uh, it's, it's unclear. Um, I think that the people that are in certain positions are trying as hard as they can to keep those posts so that they can uh, confront the government. But the government arbitrarily is taking uh, mayors out of their positions. This morning, the uh, alcaldesa de Apure uh, from Voluntad Popular uh, was taken arbitrarily out of her post. Uh, Antonio Ledesma, the mayor of Caracas, was taken out of his post arbitrarily. And it is, it is very hard for the people to support the, 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 whichever opposition is in power right now, because the government is really circling and asphyxiating what little uh, positions they have. I do believe deeply that things are, are, are changing in such a way that there will be a consolidation uh, and, and a coherent plan that will come out. But I do think that the, the, the problems right now are beyond politics, because it's an insecurity issue, it's an economic issue, uh, those things are what's really plaguing uh, the country right now, and people want answers for, they want changes for that, not so much a political rally. It's not what they're looking for. I think we're gonna go over here, and then we'll come back over here. We can get a microphone, please. Andy Judah, I'm a journalist from Argentina. The last question to the State Department about Venezuela, I did it personally three days ago. 
related to the situation of Venezuela, what's going on, the point of view from the State Department. I was in the briefing three days ago, and I was asking them what are their views, what they think is going on, and if they're only going to do statements. And when I finished the, the briefing, one of the journalists told me, I don't know if the U.S. really is doing much more in Venezuela than only sending statements. Maybe they don't care as much as before. So my point of view is, what do you expect from, from the U.S.? Are you feeling that uh, the Obama administration is really engaged in the situation of Venezuela, or this is another case and they are waiting for a change, or maybe here for another government to take this on? What, what do you think? What's, what's your real sensation of what is going on from Washington to Venezuela? So early on, Washington has shown support uh, by voicing their concern. Um, in, in specifically about Leopoldo, Obama mentioned Leopoldo in a speech. Um, I do think, however, that it makes, it's, it's not as important what the U.S. thinks if the U.S. is standing alone. I think it's important for the Americas to step up, and I'm actually most disappointed on the Latin American countries. I believe that if you're going to compare apples to apples, uh, the United States has actually been more supportive of the Venezuelan people and the crisis that they're facing than our brother countries in South America and in Central America. And let me mention, I mean, yes, the United States is important, and obviously we're here in Washington, but uh, support for Leopoldo and the Venezuelan human rights cause has been global, and I've, I've been honored to travel with Lillian Tintori around the world. We met the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who issued a very strong and public statement. We most recently met Jose Miguel and Salsa here in Washington. Uh, the president of the European Parliament. I mean, we have had extraordinary support all around the world uh, advocating for freedom, democracy, and human rights in Venezuela. Look, I think what Leopoldo has said, and, uh, and of course, I'm focused on this as a human rights matter, not as a political matter, but what Leopoldo, Leopoldo said is that it's up to each country in the world to decide how they want to react and respond to Venezuela. And so I'm not going to get out in front of him on that. What I will say is, you know, I was in the meeting with Lillian Tintori and uh, the other Venezuelans with Vice President Biden, uh, sitting across the table from him for half an hour, and there is no question in my mind that he knows exactly what is going on in Venezuela, that he cares deeply about what's happening to Leopoldo Lopez and other political prisoners, and, uh, and he spoke in a range of ways in that context about uh, what the United States has been doing and intends to do. And so I would say that, yes, it's important that the United States continue to speak out uh, and to take action. Obviously, you know, the administration's indicated that, uh, that it will implement uh, the Venezuela bill that was adopted this past December. There have already been a range of travel bans uh, put in place on some 20 plus Venezuelan officials. Uh, but at the end of the day, I couldn't agree more with Adriana. I mean, where is Latin America, right? I mean, we had the, uh, you know, President Santos of Colombia standing alone and to his immense credit, especially given the intersection of interest between Colombia and, uh, uh, and Venezuela, he spoke out for the release of political prisoners in the country. But the rest of Latin America has been absent. And, and to me, that's surprising because of how important Venezuela is to the region. And if Venezuela doesn't turn the ship around and start to do things much differently, the impact, if it implodes economically in the entire region, and the security impact in the region yeah. would be absolutely devastating. And so, to my mind, I very much hope that countries like uh, Brazil and Argentina and Chile uh, and Mexico, uh, you know, stand up, um, particularly with the forthcoming Summit of the Americas, and start to take action. I guess the last thing I have to note, which is very important, is the changing U.S. relationship with Cuba and that Maduro now is very much, obviously it's not like overnight the situation with Cuba has changed completely. There are major human rights challenges in Cuba, I say that as a human rights lawyer. Um, but the U.S. relationship with Cuba is not the same as it was for the last 60 years. And my hope is that that changing dynamic will also give the United States more ability to engage with Latin America on Venezuela as well. And, you know, uh, I'm confident that the United States will be bringing up Venezuela, Cuba, at the Summit of the Americas. And really, though, I would ask, where is Latin America? At the end of the day, if the neighbors don't care, then it's going to be very, very hard to put serious pressure on Maduro. Sure. Sure. You get a question up here. Hi. My name is Andrea. I am from Argentina, too. And my question was very related to the one that he did. I would like to know if you can explain a bit better 
was the support that you are receiving from the Latin American governments, and not only the governments, also the civil societies of organizations, because you know that in Argentina we have a lot of civil societies organizations that are working very hard in the human rights issues, and I would like to know if you're receiving any support or not, and how do you feel about that? So we and, and just to frame it a little bit, because I think it's important, because you took, mentioned a really important point, both of you, the support from Latin America. So you've had a history in countries in Latin America of authoritarian governments and violations of human rights from the right. And you also have an experience now that I guess would be defined being more from the left of authoritarianism. And you still don't have, and, and I think for a long time you had voices protesting against authoritarianism from the right, but here you have authoritarianism from the left and people seem to be silent. And that's something that I think is a contradiction with regards to just challenges in general that the region has faced. And I, I, I join in what you're saying. I think that it's a, um, that it's a bit strange, um, to say it nicely. Um, but, uh, and I want to pursue this a little bit more with the mechanisms that you would have within the OAS to deal with human rights violations the international criminal, all the, all the relevant um, branches uh, of multilateral government. Is there any way of dealing with this within that framework, uh, not just with what you're doing in Venezuela? Sure. And then uh, I'll let you answer mm -hmm. your question. Yeah. So I mean, let me say two things. One is uh, I didn't mean at all to exclude Dilma Rousseff and Brazil, right, right. Um, who of course is probably the most important person. Mm -hmm. Uh, of all in terms of relating uh, yeah. these issues and is obviously from the political left and previously was in prison herself right. and has been uh, unwilling to engage with Maduro uh, on these issues. Look, I mean, I think the OAS is complicated, uh, we all know. Uh, I think the Summit of the Americas will be a very interesting time. I think that the fact that the Secretary General of the OAS has been willing now to be outspoken about Venezuela, whereas in the past he has not, um, demonstrates, I think, a change in uh, some attitudes, mm. which I think is very, very valuable. Um, you know, there's been uh, motions recently to put Venezuela on the table within the OAS context and to have, you know, direct discussions there. I suspect when all the presidents sit down together in the room in some of the Americas, we're going to see direct, you know, questions being asked on what's happening in Venezuela. So there are definitely mechanisms within the OAS. That said, we also know the OAS is deeply divided. And when Maria Karina Machado was looking to speak to the OAS, you know, you had a majority voting to keep the room closed and then denying her the ability to speak. Yeah. Um, and I think at the end of the day, that speaks volumes about where Latin America is. But it's interesting. I've had, we've had a lot of discussions. We've traveled the world. We've met privately with a lot of Latin American diplomats. And they speak about non-interference. And you know, when you're talking to governments that have come from authoritarian contexts, we have directly raised with them, well, that's OK. That's interesting that you're talking about non-interference. And I understand that given the history of Latin America and interference, shall we say, from outside the region, mm -hmm. um, you are very sensitive to that. But is that what you were calling for when you were living in under authoritarian government? Did you want non-interference? Did you want the world to be silent? Did you not people, want people to speak up for human rights and democracy? And by the way, it turns out, of course, as we all know, that Venezuela sheltered many, many people who were fleeing Pinochet in Chile or you know, various Latin American dictatorships. Where are you supporting the people of Venezuela, not the government, but the people of Venezuela who were there when you were living under dictatorship yourself? And unfortunately, we haven't gotten any good answers to those questions, except that you know, we hear what you're saying, and thank you for sharing. And uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I think that this hopefully will be the drumbeat in the run up to the Summit of the Americas, which is, is the OAS going to stand silent, or is it going to be counted in this situation? Because again, to me, it isn't just about Leopoldo and the political prisoners and human rights, although to me, that's a central issue. But it's also about what is the effect of Venezuela's collapse going to have on the region, and why aren't countries in Latin America more worried about that? Um, and so that, to me, is a yep. critical question. So to your points, I, I have two points. One is, uh, and, and to answer you directly, uh, we have not received, uh, Venezuela has not really received support from sitting uh, governors, but there, are, uh, there has been an outpour of support for Leopoldo specifically, as well as for the human rights violations in Venezuela from uh, numerous uh, organizations all over uh, the continent. I don't know, the, the name escapes me, but there's a commission of human rights, uh, or there's a congregation of human rights groups, and every one of those organizations has pronounced itself in support of Venezuela, asking for Leopoldo's liberation. 
uh, ex-presidents have shown support for Leopoldo and for political prisoners. In fact, some of them tried to visit and were not allowed to visit Leopoldo. Uh, I think the issue is, you were asking about the Obama administration, so we're talking about sitting governments and what are those sitting politicians doing or not doing. The people that have less at stake, so to speak, because they're not sitting on the, on the, on the top of the, of the pinnacle, have been very outspoken. The other point about right or left, if you care to know, we've had support from Internacional Socialista, which is left for Leopoldo and for Voluntad Popular and for political prisoners in Venezuela. We've had support from Piñera, who is from the right in Chile. So I don't think that this is a right or left issue. When you're talking about human rights violations, it cannot be divided in, in a left or a right. And in Venezuela right now, the problem is a deep violation of human rights. Okay. Okay. Let me uh, go all the way in the back. Hi, I'm Pedro Urelli. I'm a friend of Leopoldo's and her family. Um, one of the things uh, that the family has done with the help of Jared is raise the cost for the government of having Leopoldo in jail. Obviously, the news about this case uh, has gone you know, way up in the last months, so people are beginning to know him like other famous political prisoners. The problem, and what I wanted to ask, Jared, from your perspective and your experience is, as the cost of keeping him goes up, the cost of releasing him also goes up. Uh, Leopoldo has become the symbol uh, of a lot in Venezuela. Uh, while there are people who might not have agreed with him at the beginning, I think it would be a little bit like Adriana said, if he's released. The government knows that. So if the government was fearful of him in 2004, and in 2005, and in 2006, and onwards, they've actually built a very powerful politician who, for any of us who listen to him in CNN, he was 10 times better on CNN than a year ago. I mean, and he was good a year ago. Um, what happens, Jared? How do we get a government who has obviously made a huge mistake, <coughs> who's now realizing that its worst enemy has become a massively powerful individual. How do you get an out for a government so that we don't have to wait for the government to go away as a means of getting Leopoldo out? Is there a mechanism by which somehow this can be negotiated? Because I think this is what happens with this very powerful uh, persons of conscience, that they become almost too difficult to release. Yeah. Well, and it's a great question, Pedro. It's, it's, I've spent 15 years of my life pondering that over and over and over again on every case that I work on. Uh, what I would say is this, that there are different people that will play different roles here. Um, our role on behalf of Leopoldo and the family is to use his story to tell the story of Venezuela around the world and for the family to advocate for his freedom out of their political prisoners and for justice and accountability for <coughs> perpetrators. There will be others who will be looking for easy ways out for Venezuela or face-saving ways out, and frankly, that isn't our role. Um, at the end of the day, Maduro would never let Leopoldo out whether he was as well known as he is now or whether he wasn't. When they put him in prison, he was already a big threat, and that's why they locked him up. And so my experience has been that the only thing that dictators understand is fear. Right? That is the only emotion that drives them is fear. And Maduro will not let him out because he wants to. He will never let him out because he wants to. He will let him out because he has to. And it will be because he is looking at two bad choices, and the least worst alternative is letting Leopoldo out. And so our role and what we will continue to do, and we are going to fight aggressively and strongly and repeatedly and relentlessly, is to raise the cost of Maduro in every forum that we travel around the world to keep the pressure on Maduro, to tell Leopoldo's story, you know, and, uh, and to leave it to the world to put pressure on the government of Venezuela. Others will figure out how there's a graceful exit for Maduro. Obviously, we're talking to lots of people, including people who talk to the government of Venezuela. Um, but I agree with you, you know, it is always a trade-off between the rising costs and the rising benefits, and you're right. He will be released and he'll be dramatically more powerful. At the end of the day, the question for Maduro, I think, is going to become, is he going to maintain his grip on power because everything is going to spin out of control? Or if he releases Leopoldo, will he have a lifeline thrown to him by a couple of governments that will enable him to remain in power? Mm -hmm. And if it's a choice between remaining in power versus a Ceausescu outcome, <laughs> you know, or, uh, or otherwise, I'm thinking Maduro's pretty smart, and he's going to want to live, and he's going to remain in charge. 
he, but he'll never let them out because he wants to. It's only because he has no choice. And so our job is to make it as painful and as difficult and as frustrating and as infuriating as we can. And that is exactly what we are doing, and that is what we're going to keep doing until he makes the right decision. Okay. I think there's another. I think you had a question, sir. Yeah. With the glasses, let me get a microphone quickly. Okay. Yes, I'm Per Korovsky. I just wondered, also a good friend of your father, Leopoldo. Um, how much? Why is the Leopoldo's case? and whole Venezuela's case not really placed in the context of the reality of a government receiving 97% of all the export income of the country. It, it, it's sort of a, such a concentration of power that anything can happen in any type of country like that. And sometimes when I speak with some of the people in the OES and all that, what I hear, government people, is a sort of envy over the type of power that the governments in Venezuela have, and they don't. So, so why is it not really never displaced in the context of just an excessive power, government power, no matter what, no matter what in a country? Imagine this country, if 97% of all the export revenues of the US went into the government. It's, it's, it's just, uh, you know, mind-boggling to think of it. So I think that we have to also place Leopoldo in that context, what is happening to him and what is happening to others. This is a just too powerful government, and with such power, anything can happen. Well, I mean, it is a daunting situation, and if we were, if we let what you, the picture that you painted, if we let that lead us or lead Leopoldo, then we would give up, and, and I think that the, thankfully, in history, there are people like Leopoldo and other people in Venezuela that are fighting because they do believe that although they are the most powerful, that there is a David to fight Goliath. I mean, that's all I can say. I, I, I just, I wonder why Leopoldo took up this fight, and it's because he believes that he can make a change, because if nobody stands up to the government, then they will stay in power if nobody cares. It, it's so worth, it's, it's, it's... I mean, it's worth noting, one of the things that I thought has been found interesting is, Look, I, I do human rights, I don't do politics, but obviously I read things before I take up a case about who my potential client might be. And when I was reading about Leopoldo before I got involved in the case, you know, I saw that kind of the Chavistas and the government portrayed him as being of the political right and of him being you know, part of a uh, elite aristocracy of Venezuela. And, and I think that the, the one thing that I've learned is uh, you know, getting to know him, getting to know his family over the last uh, seven or eight months is, I mean, that is about as far off a, an assessment as one can, uh, can come up with. And I think that, you know, when I read his speeches and what he stood for, the speech he gave on February 12th, when I've seen his platforms and what he argues for, you know, he's a human rights partisan. He's not a political partisan. I mean, he's called for change to the government of Venezuela through the Constitution and the means provided in the Constitution, nonviolently and in accordance with the rule of law. <coughs> he's called for human rights for all people. You know, he's called for reforming the economic system of Venezuela so that, that the poor have a fighting shot at it. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, these are all just political labels that get thrown around. But, I mean, what he stands for and what he's advocating for to me as a human rights lawyer is purely straight down the middle, you know, freedom, democracy, and human rights. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, and so I think that, you know, there are obviously a whole lot much broader set of problems going on in Venezuela right now that are more than just human rights. But I think that on his behalf, the family has decided to focus on human rights because frankly, unless you have fundamental human rights assured for all people in a country, free speech, freedom of association, freedom to vote for your political leaders, right? The rule of law, without any of those basic fundamental human rights, the ability to actually address the problems of a country of the size of the problems of Venezuela are next to impossible, really because you can't ever hold the government to account for the bad decisions it's making, and governments like that that are authoritarian are corrupt, inefficient, and unaccountable. Um, and so I think that Leopoldo's arguments that he puts forward, which are focused on human rights first, um, is actually probably the only way that Venezuela has a fighting chance to turn the ship around economically and politically in this country. 
think we're gonna, I think there were two other questions. So we're gonna take those two questions and I think we're gonna wrap up. So uh, the gentleman over there and then the lady up here. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, taking in Mr. Lopez is definitely a violation of uh, freedom of speech. But taking in Mr. Lezama uh, at the same time, uh, Ledesma at the, uh, a little later, makes this more of a case of trying to get rid of the opposition. Uh, the question is, what is the relation? The second question is, what uh, situation, what act uh, could have triggered this situation? And the last question is, how much of uh, an influence uh, has the Cuban uh, Secret Service or the security apparatus in uh, present uh, Venezuela? So, so why now is, I guess, part of the question. So, so Ledesma, along with Maria Corina Machado, uh, have accompanied and supported Leopoldo's plight. So the three of them were, of the opposition, very outspoken uh, in, their, in their asks of the government for change. Leopoldo went first, um, I, I believe because they fear Leopoldo the most. Uh, they went after Ledesma. I don't understand why they went after Ledesma and not others all at once. If, if there was a conspiracy, you would assume there would be more than one person. They just took one instead of taking the whole posse and get rid of that. It's the, the, the decisions that this government makes are, 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 are puzzling. Uh, and you know, if, if, if it was a smart government, it wouldn't be making these this decisions. I, I, I think everybody's very puzzled as to why they literally kidnapped uh, the, the mayor of Caracas, the city mayor of Caracas from his office. Uh, with no evidence. Uh, I can only presume that there are more coming. This is a matter of time. Uh, they are scared of the opposition. That's what, this is a desperate government, and they're doing desperate things. Um, Cuba has been in Venezuela for a long time, and so that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> another session, right up here. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Heather Scott from Market News International. Um, Adriana, I wanted to ask you, um, what it is, further, continuing what you were just saying a little moment ago, what it, w is it that you would like to see happen that is most likely to trigger some kind of change? Is it an outpouring from human rights organizations, Latin American governments, would the OES you know, action help? It doesn't seem that Maduro is sympathetic to any sort of outside pressure. So what do you think needs to happen that would force his hand and force him to at least sit down at the negotiating table to change these policies? Well, the, the Venezuelan government preceding Maduro, the Venezuelan Chavez's government, has a history of not responding to any type of international sanctions that have been bestowed upon them. In Leopoldo's case, specifically in the Human Rights Commission in Costa Rica, in the case of uh, uh, Judge Afuni, when she actually ruled because of the uh, United Nations decision on uh, arbitrary detention. In Leopoldo's case, when they ruled uh, that Leopoldo's detention was arbitrary, they have not freed him. It is a government that does not care about international organizations, although it is in our constitution that international decisions supersede uh, national, um, national rulings. So they are in blatant, um, um, what, what, what I'm looking for? Disregard. Disregard of the constitution of Venezuela and all the international treaties that we are in. So what can we hope? We can hope for pressure. Now, realistically, what's going to turn uh, uh, the government around? I think the only thing is that the world comes to a consensus that stops buying oil from Venezuela. You have to cut the cash. It's the only thing, because any, any, any type of legal pressure that has been put upon the government, they seem to disregard it. Now, do we need to keep the pressure on? Absolutely. The more eyes and awareness that there is about the Venezuelan political prisoners, including Leopoldo, the safer they can be. Leopoldo, they have threatened to move Leopoldo to twice already uh, to some very dangerous prisons in mm -hmm. Venezuela, and they have not. And I believe that in large part they haven't done that because there has been so much international awareness about every movement about Leopoldo. So what I ask of the international community is to maintain the pressure and maintain, maintain the awareness on Venezuela, because if we let loose, then they're going to get away with murder. Well, those are individual sanctions, and that's, a, that, 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 that's something that each government decides what to do. Um, 
but I do think that there, there need to be more than just pronouncements. There need to be some specific actions that hurt individuals in power. I will, I will say, though, that, the, that on the one hand, they don't appear to be changing their behavior based on the public outcry, but they also are lashing out in ways that are irrational and, uh, and entertaining uh, in a whole host of ways by the claims that they make. And that actually helps us a lot. I mean, I've gone up against authoritarian governments that are as nasty as they get. Take a China, for example. Right? They don't respond publicly at all anymore these days because they know that even the United States, the UK, and France are going to be soft peddling on human rights because we have lots of intertwining interests. Right? And the fact that Maduro keeps publicly responding to all of these attacks that are on him demonstrates profound weakness. Right? Profound weakness because if he was not, if he was strong and if he was confident, he could just do what he wanted and not care what anybody had to say. But he has his narrative he has to put out to the Chavistas, and he has to be viewed as internationally defending the honor of Venezuela. And to me, that demonstrates that there is an opportunity here to move a Venezuela, which frankly is dramatically harder to move a China. Um, and, uh, and so I do think that that provides a moment of hope um, to think that you know, rather than saying, OK, let's step back and let's kind of regroup, right? what we're doing is working. Right? And we need to take it to the next level, and we need to keep the pressure on. Last question, right here. Um, could you just get the microphone here? Sorry. Here's the microphone. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> I think just to, to follow up on your comment about, um, about oil and buying oil. So my understanding is the United States is actually the only country that, that pays market price. Obviously, the market price is down right now. So should, in your view, should the U.S. play the oil card? Should the U.S. stop? Um, I'm not to importing. say that, that I don't have enough information to say that, but this is just an hypothetical. This is, this is a hypothetical answer to a government that does not respond to many uh, pressures that come internationally. Uh, I think that in the end, cutting oil from Venezuela would end up really hurting Venezuelans because it is where we get the money to 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 keep the country going. Um, that's not the answer. The answer is real change, real hard economic. Decisions need to be made to turn the country around and let a, an oil producing country do what it does, which is effectively produce oil and other things to maintain a, a healthy economy. So with, having said that, I want to thank Kenyon College for, for helping make this happen. Jared, thank you so much. And in particular, I just want to thank you, Adriana, for coming, sharing this. It has to be difficult to have your brother in that situation but you're doing the right thing by uh, going out there and building awareness of his case and of what's happening in Venezuela. So uh, if you could all join me in a round of applause, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you.